Good morning, everyone. Welcome into this place this morning, and welcome to any visitors or to you who are joining us online. Uh, just a few announcements, and the first is that next week, as you see in your bulletin, we will be having our all-church potluck after the morning service. Uh, likewise, on the 26th, that's Wednesday, the 26th, we will be having, the gems will be having the harvest party. And there's a note here from Vicky that says, our fall harvest party and soup supper is not just our GEMS fundraiser, and it is not just for the kids. It is an opportunity for all of us to fellowship together, and we would love everyone to come. If you need a ride, please talk to Vicki. So, please set that aside on your calendar. Mark that Wednesday the 26th to come and support and fellowship with the GEMS and that ministry. Uh, likewise, speaking of fellowship, as small group ministry has begun recently and is in the process of starting up again, if you're not in a small group and you would like to be in a small group, I certainly encourage you to be involved in one. Please just come speak with one of the elders and we'll get you plugged in. And then the final announcement is for our offerings. This morning we will be taking up an offering for the general fund, and this evening will be for the work of Tim with Youth Dynamics. But with that, as we come into the presence of our God, we assemble at his call, and so I ask that you stand for his call to worship. Out of Psalm 100, the Lord calls us by saying, Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. Let's respond in prayer. Lord, what a blessing it is to be those whom you have called. We know that it is an unconditional call. There is nothing, Lord, for that initial call to bring us to life, to quicken us in the spirit there was nothing in us that you foresaw, nothing in us that you looked down the corridors of time and said, that is the one that I want because of this. Rather, it was indiscriminate. You called out to us because you called out to us. And so as we enter into this place, knowing, Lord, that we have nothing, nothing in our hands that we bring, we ask that we will sing and we will worship, we will praise, we will give you our hearts and our minds, we will tune our attention to you, all because you are worthy, all because we know that our salvation, our life, our growth in holiness, our eternal home is simply because you are the good God. We see that in the call, Lord, that tells us to worship you, to sing, to enter, to know, all because you are good and because your steadfast love and faithfulness extends through all generations, reveal that to us today and let us worship in that great joy. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Our opening two songs this morning are We Praise You, O God, and we will follow that by singing Blessed Be the Lord God Almighty.
As you can see, we are worshiping the God who was, who is, and who is to come, and we do so by turning to his word in Isaiah 44. And there in those few verses, in verses 6 through 8, we see the immutable God, the unchanging God, a God of whom there is no like. And then we will turn to confess our faith in the Heidelberg Catechism, questions 26, 27, and 28, and that will be looking at the providence of our God, his ability uh, to provide all of our needs. And so out of Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 8, we say, Thus says the Lord God, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. As we see that again, he is the God who has told us the end from the beginning. As he continues to provide, we turn to the Heidelberg Catechism, and I ask that uh, you'll respond and confess your faith in the answer to these questions. And so when we look at there being no other rock, no other God, we ask, well, what do you believe when you confess that? When you say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. That the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and everything in them, who still upholds and rules them by his eternal counsel and providence, is my God and Father because of Christ his Son. I trust him so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul, and he will turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me in this sad world. He is able to do this because he is Almighty God. He desires to do this because he is a faithful father. That's really a definition of providence, but we continue and ask then, well, what do you understand by the providence of God? Providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God by which he upholds as with his hand heaven and earth and all creatures and so rules them that are leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty. All things, in fact, come to us, not by chance, but from his fatherly hand. And finally, how does the knowledge of this, how does the knowledge of God's creation and providence help us? We can be patient when things go against us, thankful when things go well, and for the future, we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that nothing will separate us from his love. All creatures so completely in his hand that without his will, they can neither move nor be moved. Let's respond by singing this, to this awesome God by singing awesome God followed by holy, holy, holy.
So we lift up our voices in unity. So now in prayer, let lift up our hearts in unity. Let's spend some time in prayer. Father, as we come to you, you are what we have seen, what we have heard, what we've sang, what we've read, what we've confessed. You are the holy, holy, holy God. You are the God who was, who is, and the God who is to come. Your word tells us that you are the changeless one. And we have such an opportunity before us in this service to worship and to praise you for that. It's a wonderful thing when we can come and gather and we can worship for the things that you do, the things that you give us, such as peace and joy. But it is such a wonder as well that we can come and worship who you are. Because it shows that you've revealed yourself to us. We see throughout the scriptures that you are the one who is absolutely perfect and yet perfect in absolutes. You are perfect in love and power and purity. You're perfect in holiness. We looked at that last week, Father, in the scriptures. We, we saw your holiness. We saw that you are the one who is above, beyond, otherly. But you are also the one who is full of might and power. You are the one who is terrifying. Or just words in our, our language that have been co-opted to mean something else, but you are truly the definition of adorable. Not something that is cute, but something to be adored. That which is worthy of adoration. And you are awful, not in the sense that you are bad, but the one who fills us with awe. And yet we can come and we can worship and we can praise because you have revealed yourself as the God of all might and power, as the God of adorableness, as the God of awfulness. You have come and revealed yourself to us in your Son. You have upheld the highest perfection of your holiness and justice and love at the cross of Christ. And we worship you for that, Father, and we thank you for that. Because as we see all throughout the scriptures, as you give us that passage in Isaiah, where you tell us, there is none like me. I have ordained people to sing this praise. Go and ask them. They will tell you there's no other rock. It's me alone. There's no God like me. As in the scriptures, you tell us that you are jealous and zealous for your own name, that you guard it carefully. As the Ten Commandments pour out to us, we can have no other gods. We cannot take your name in vain. We cannot worship you in any way that you do not ordain. We cannot take this day for ourselves. It shows us again, Father, as we saw last week, that you are the God who values yourself above all. And yet what we worship, Lord, is that you do that. That you don't change. That you don't condescend in the sense that you change your plan when we are crying or in pain, but you have ordained all of this to take us through so that we may see you, know you, glorify you, and that you may stand in your perfections before us. But the wonder that we praise as well, in addition to that, Lord, is that as you bring us through suffering, as you bring us through pain, as you bring us through this dark world, as you stand with one plan to uphold your holiness, it shows us too, Father, that there is nothing in this world that is more valuable and nothing more worthy than you. And Lord, we confess that as we come into this room, we might not have been here last week or the week before. We might not come tonight. We might not heed the call of your assembling. We might not be in the word throughout the week. We might not think of you. We might be disobedient to your word, which calls us to meditate on the law day and night, to let the word dwell richly in us. We come, Father, and we confess. We are fickle. We are sinful. We have all sorts of other gods, all sorts of other things in this world that delight us or that numb us or that we press onward to claim as our own. Forgive us, Father, because we confess as well in the exact same breath that there is none like you. There is no other happiness, no other joy, no other lasting peace, 
And we ask that you would drive us ever onward to you. Press us always back to the cross. Let us see Christ on his throne. Put in our hearts that song that you are awesome and that you are holy. Because, Father, we don't want what the world offers. We want you. And so we ask that you will wash clean and that you will strip us of all those things that our grubby hearts cling to and instead replace them with a true love and a true joy in you alone because you, Father, are the only holy, holy, holy God. But as we see, Lord, that you say in that Isaiah passage again that it's not simply that you are the only rock and that you are the only God and that you are the only Lord, you also have said again that there are people that you've ordained to sing your praises. And I thank you for the church. I thank you, Lord, that you walk with us, that you are in our cars on the way here, that you are in our homes, that the word and the Psalms tell us, Lord, that the reason that we sleep in safety is because you watch over us and you grant it to us. The reason that we are able here to gather again is because you have walked us through another week and because as we've confessed, you are the God who is not simply the God of and in the heavens, but you rule over leaf and blade. You rule over grass. You rule over everything, Lord. You are so intimately involved in this creation. And so we thank you that you have put your name on this place, that you have given yourself to the church, and that we can live in that joy and that wonder. And Lord, I thank you then for the people in this room. We thank you for those whose work so often goes unseen, for Frida and everything she does in the office, Lord, who takes messages and allows the affairs of the church to continue, who puts the bulletins together, who updates the website and so on and so forth. We thank you for Anne as well, Lord, as we look at that website. It is it's really a work of art. We thank you for the work that Daryl has done here Lord, how many Saturdays and evenings has he come to replace things outside, things that I don't even think we notice? And the list could go on and on and on, Father. There are so many people that have given themselves to praise you and to worship you, not just by gathering here on a Sunday, but in the things they do during the week. Thank you that we can see you at work. Thank you for the church. And we pray that you will continue to work through us. We pray specifically, Lord, for Tim. So we take up an offering for him this evening. We pray for the work of youth dynamics and for that ministry as a whole. Because we see in this world, there's this strong and powerful effort to destroy families, to separate the mind of children and teens from their parents, to peel their eyes away from you. And we thank you for those like Tim who have received that call to go into labor and to work among them. We pray for success on that journey you tell us. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So we do ask that you raise up and send harvesters, but also that you will give great success for those, again, like Tim, that you have sent in there already. Father, we also pray that you will continue to strengthen this church in a very hostile world. We ask that that can be seen in our Sunday school, that what the leaders do, and we thank you for them, what they teach to these children can be something that is caught and something that is buried deep within their heart. Something that will come to their mind as well quickly. So that as they are, Lord, stepping into a world of great hostilities and evils, you will give them discernment. And that you'll fill them with a love of your word and a love of you. We also pray for the persecuted church, Lord. Facing horrors that we know nothing about. Facing the questions of compromise or death or compromise, or loss of work, or compromise, or jail, or anything else. And we pray that you will keep them strong to show them as well that there is one holy, holy God. There is only one from whom all perfections and all joy flows. And everything else in this world is tangential. It's fleeting. It will perish in the grave. Like our bodies, it is dust to dust. But unlike our bodies, it will not be risen. It will be pushed down, and it will burn for eternity in the flames of hell. And so we ask that you will keep their eyes focused on you, that you will hold them in peace, that you will hold them in strength, that you will protect the doctrine in their minds and from their lips, and that through that, through, as your word says, the saints 
not loving their life so much as to shrink from death, it will be a great testimony and we can see the church grow and a revival happen. Let not the edges of your church and your kingdom crumble, but strengthen it through and through. Father, we pray all of this because we have such confidence and assurance that you as the almighty God are able to do this. But we also have the assurance that you as our loving Father desire to do this. And as we think on your love, we ask for your comfort for those in this room, those who are hurting, those who have seen the loss of life recently. We pray this continually for the Plagermans, Father, with the loss of Gertz and for the Chokers as well. We pray also as well for Clarence as we received the news this past week of the sudden passing of his son. We just pray for the entire Miedema family. Lord, we don't know why, why you take people at a time that you desire. But we do rejoice in knowing that he is with you and he belongs to you. And we pray that that will be comfort, that it will not be a grief of hopelessness, but a grief of anticipation, waiting for Christ to come again. Root us and keep us in that hope, our unchanging God. This we pray in the name of our Savior. Amen. This time we will take up our offering for the general fund.
Children are dismissed for children's worship, and we will turn in God's word. We'll be continuing our study through Genesis, but we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 today. And the reason we'll be looking at that is because we have ended our time in Genesis 1 to 3. It's what uh, people call kind of the halfway point of the Bible. Um, some say Genesis 1 through 11, but we also see that with Genesis 1 through 3. That everything changes. It's that climactic moment where we see a new creation, really a new birth, where Adam and Eve are cast out of the presence of God, and they continue their life outside in the wilderness of this earth. And we'll pick up with that next week, but we wanted to look back over these themes that we've seen and see what it can teach us to know and trust and believe that Genesis 1 through 3 is the true history of God. And so we'll see that through the lens of Hebrews 13, verse 8, again, going back and recalling the themes that we have seen. But before we do that, let's call on God in prayer. Father, as we bow our heads again, we come to your word. It's not ours, it's yours. It is what you have written down, what you have inspired, what you have protected through the ages. It's what you want us to know and what you want us to learn. And so we ask that you will guard it today as you always have. Guard it against any sinful inclinations from my heart and my lips and my mind. Guard it from any sinful inclinations of we who receive it as well. But instead, speak to us. Comfort where we need to be comforted. Afflict where we need to be afflicted. Admonish where we need to be admonished. We trust you, Father, that it is your word that this is what you have ordained. And so we pray, Father, that you will lead us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Again, Hebrews 13, verse 8. This is the word of God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. This is the infallible word of God. Mike Glodo, who is a professor at Reformed Theological Seminary, he once preached a sermon. And he opened that sermon. It always sat with me after I heard this about this remarkable experience that he had on an airplane. Because as he was sitting there, a, a flight attendant came up to him, and he wasn't really sure why, but she said to him, would you like to come and sit in the cockpit? And so he said, sure, that sounds great. And so he went, and they gave him a seat there, and he said he had this just remarkable experience and this remarkable view, because he was able to look back at the plane and all the passengers, those with whom he was traveling and where he was sitting, but then he could also turn and he could look ahead, and he could see the sky before him, he could see the landscape, and he could see the destination of way, where they were going. And so he said it was this very unique view where he could look back and where he could look ahead. And I bring that up because that's exactly what we're going to do today. As I said, we're going to look back. Look back on Genesis 1 through 3. And then we will look ahead and see how God brings to bud all the seeds that he had planted in Genesis 1 to 3. And then apply how that affects our today. Because what Hebrews 13 verse 8 tells us is that we worship an unchanging God. And what that means is that as we look back to see God's sovereign work in the past and his providential work for the future, we can have peace in him today. So with that said, again, we close our time in the Garden of Eden. But before we do, we have to look back one last time over what the Lord himself has taught us and taught us about himself and I think it's very important to do this and to close out these chapters by looking back because there's a very concerted effort in this world to castigize these chapters as myth. 
It's really done for the first 11 chapters of Scripture, but especially in Genesis 1 to 3, there's people in this world and in the church as well who are trying to say that these are myth. They didn't really happen. But what the Bible presents to us, and the whole New Testament is based on this, we're going to see this for Revelation as well, these are history. This actually happened. That is, it's not the history of something like Star Wars, right? It didn't happen a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Rather, what we read as we go through this is your history, my history, the history of this world, the history of how things came to be. It's the Bible's first assertion, isn't it? In the beginning. And that is, in the beginning of the world. And if we lose that, we move these into the realm of myth, we lose what this history tells us about our God. Because for there to be a definitive beginning where something starts, it must mean that there is something behind that beginning, causing all of this to happen. That's what Aristotle called the prime mover, right? For something like evolution, which has absolutely no basis in science or fact, even said by evolutionists, for that to happen, if it were to happen, there has to be something moving this. There has to be an instigating cause. If dominoes are going to fall, someone has to set them up and push them over. If a story is going to start, then author needs to make a stroke with the pen. In other words, when the Bible is presenting to us history and says, in the beginning, it's presenting to us not just the beginning that's going to follow, but the one who is behind it all, telling us what that history is. And so what we see here is a story that has begun and initiated in the voice of the one who is immediately shown to be all-powerful, all-wise, the only sovereign creator. See what that means? It means what we study here is a truth that is revealed to us, and it's revealed by God alone. We are not left to guesswork. We are not left to unverified speculation because we are told by the one who stands behind the beginning and sets all things into motion. And what he tells us as we move off of that first verse is that he begins to speak. And as he begins to speak, everything in existence comes into existence. This is not the reorganization of matter, for there was nothing outside of God. Rather, it is the creation of matter and the science that holds them all together. What Genesis 1 presents to us is real, real history, is the Lord speaking and light breaking into existence for the very first time. The Lord speaking and the mountains, including Baker, coming forth. The earth being created, including the dirt beneath your feet or the grass that you feel between your toes. We see as well when the Lord speaks, the lilac is conceived, it is brought forth, and it is colored in the perfect shade of purple as it so pleases the Creator. But I want you to stop and think about that and the implications of that. Because what the implication of Genesis 1 is, is that God is not simply creating things. God is not just an interior decorator that throws things into a room. Rather, he must also, by consequence, be creating how those things work together. He has to be creating the harmony between those things. So maybe this is a little bit of a silly example, but consider pizza. If you want to make a pizza, it begins with a dough, right? And if you want to make a very basic dough, you need what? Water and flour and salt and yeast and probably a little bit of sugar to activate that yeast as well. But each of those are a separate ingredient that comes from a different part of the earth. It needs to be harvested in some capacity in order to get into your cupboard. But all of those different things can be combined in such a way that when you knead it and you work it and you let it rest, it can form a soft and a springy dough. And then on that dough, you can crush up tomatoes into a nice sauce. You can put it on there. You can take cheese, which has gone through a remarkable process of its own, and you can put it on there as well in other, with other sorts of ingredients. Now, those are all separate things, right? They're all separate ingredients. But when they are put together in a proper way, the Lord has ordained that they become one meal. Of course, that meal is nothing until you add heat which is another outside component, totally outside of food, that the Lord has ordained to change things. But still, that meal with its heat is nothing until it has an effect on you. And think about that effect. Because what Genesis 2.9 tells us is that before food is nutritious to the body, it is pleasing to the eye. 
And that means that when you're hungry, if, if you're a normal human and you see a picture of pizza, because pizza is delicious, you will start to groan in your stomach. Your mouth will start to salivate. You will grow even hungrier. And then as you eat that pizza, it delights your taste buds and begins supplying your body with energy and nutrients. And of course, that meal couldn't exist unless you can first understand how those things work, how you can get them into your cupboard, how to combine them, how to cook them, and what it's going to do for you. Do you see all the separate things, all the different things, not just ingredients and how they're harvested and how they work together, but how you conceive, how you eat, how it affects your body. All of that is conceptualized and put into Genesis 1. That's what it's presenting to us, not just things, but how those things work how they would affect us, how they can be used in different scenarios through time and so on. Genesis 1 says that's what God brought forth by his spoken word, and he did it all to glorify his name. That's what the creation account is telling us. Your God is the God of your taste buds. He is the God over the colors that your eye perceives. He's the God over how you feel when the sun beats on your face over a long winter. He is the God of what you think of those things, and he is the God of everything in between. What Genesis is telling us is that in real space, in real time, in real history, God created the earth in six days and everything that was in them. Psalm 24, it tells us the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And when he was done creating all that science and how all of this works together and the harmony between every molecule and all of creation, we are told that on the seventh day he rested. But this, as we saw, is no rest of inactivity. Rather, what Derek Kidner says is that it's the rest of achievement. In other words, what is God doing here? He's not heading out on vacation. He's moving further into his work. This is seen throughout scripture as a divine enthroning. It is God taking his seat on the cosmic throne. That's what we worship. That's what we celebrate today. Yes, the resurrection of Christ, but also the ascension of Christ, where he reigns forevermore, where he sits on the throne. What we see there on the seventh day of, creator is, er, of creation is the creator of all things moving into becoming the sustainer of all things. It's why Colossians 1.17 says, In him all things hold together. Because as the prophet Jeremiah tells us, he's the one who sends rain. He's the one who brings forth lightning and so on and so forth. It is God who we are told in Job tells the sun to rise and tells the sun to set. And so when we look at the past and we look at the creation account and we get to the end of it, what this real history is telling to us and revealing to us is that every atom and every molecule of creation, how they come together and work together, the very function that they serve and everything about them is created by God. It is controlled by God. It is brought about by God. And it exists and continues under the sovereign reign of God for the pleasure and the glory of our God. That's what Genesis 1 is saying to us. As R.C. Sproul so famously says, there is not one maverick molecule. What this tells us is that nothing, not even the devil himself, can do something outside of God's will and power. And if that's what Genesis is telling us, and if our passage tells us that ours is the unchanging God, that he is today and he is forever who he was yesterday, it shows us then that he is, he was, and he shall always be the all-powerful God. Do you see what our passage is saying? God creates all things and he sits on his throne. It is impossible then for him to ever abdicate that throne. It is impossible then for any outside force to ever come and challenge his reign on that throne because there is nothing that could possibly exist outside of the will and the pleasure of our God. What this means for us to know that our God is the same today, right now in this room as he was in Genesis, is that he's in control of everything. You see, we may fear the forces of this world, we may fear the principalities that are driving governmental agendas. We may fear those cancer cells that have come into our body or the weapons of those who attack us. But the Lord who created all things is still the God who rules all of those things. This is why Jehoshaphat on the eve of war, 2 Chronicles 20 verse 6, 
said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Do you spend your days worrying? Why? Why do we fret? Why are we concerned about inflation? Why are we terrified about persecution? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It means he's still on the throne. He is still in control. All power still belongs to him. There is nothing in heaven. There is nothing in hell. There is nothing in all of creation that can challenge his unlosable grip on his sovereign seat of might. What does our passage tell us? Be at peace. It's not Joe Biden or Donald Trump or Justin Trudeau or Jay Inslee that will dictate how your life plays out. It is God alone. Now, in saying that, you might start to think, hold on. Okay, I get that. God is powerful. But all powerful seems to be a stretch, right? Because Genesis 1 and 2 tells us he is this great God. He is this powerful and this sovereign God. But Genesis 3 kind of seems to pop that bubble. Because suddenly, in this world, we have the entrance of evil. We have the fall of man. We have our separation from God. And this idyllic world that we read about in this primordial history, well, it just seems like a fairy tale. If God is all-powerful, how in the world could he allow that to happen? And the answer is that we don't know. (laughs) We don't know why evil came about or how evil came about, but this we do know. God is not the author nor the ally of evil. And yet he will, bring, he will use evil to bring about a greater good and a greater glory than anyone could ever imagine. Augustine went so far as to write this, God judged it better to bring good out of evil than to suffer no evil at all. In other words, we can say that evil is not good, but it is for good that evil exists. How can we see that? Look at Genesis 3 again. After man's rebellion, what does God do? He begins planting a bunch of seeds in this theological garden that are going to blossom throughout Scripture into the doctrines of salvation and grace. Genesis 3.15, after Adam and Eve rebel, God stands in all his judgment, all his might, all his power. And what does he say? I'm not going to condemn the entire world, but I'm going to separate a seed of the devil from a seed of the woman. In other words, I will establish my church. And in that same verse, what am I going to do from that seed? I will rise up one who's going to crush evil. This is so clearly pointing to Christ on the cross. Because Colossians 2 says, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities on the cross. He put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. The Lord then, Genesis 3, 16 through 19, he says, you're going to have pain in childbirth, discord in marriages. You're going to have work with great toil. Your life is going to end in the dust of death. In other words, do you want happiness and meaning in life? You can't have it. All of it is placed under the curse of sin. But Christ Jesus, he takes on the very sign of that curse because he bears the crown of thorns where Galatians 3 says he became the curse for us, that in him, says 2 Corinthians 5, we might become the righteousness of Christ. All of that is foreshadowed then, Genesis 3, 20 to 24, when the naked and the ashamed and the non-innocent Adam and Eve are covered. Something that later symbolizes marriage and our being covered in the righteousness of Christ Jesus as he brings us back into the very presence of God. All of that, all of these doctrines of grace, all the wonder of our God are planted in seed form before we leave Eden. How is that used for our good? It's because we saw a sovereign creator. We saw the all-powerful creator. We saw the one who is in control of all things. But now what do we see? Something we couldn't before. Something that we're told in 1 Peter 1 that even the angels desire and long to look into and understand. A holy God, a just God, a loving God, a merciful God, a gracious God who doesn't simply create, but who condemns and who saves. So think about that. Because again, as we look at our passage, it tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we say, amen, that's true as we look in the past. He is great yesterday. 
But it's an unfalsifiable statement, isn't it? You can't prove it right or you can't prove it wrong. How can he be the same forever? Because we don't get to look into the future and we don't get to know if God actually does this and if he actually accomplishes these things. Anyone can promise anything and we can say, what an amazing person, they promised me a million dollars. But how do you know if they're going to pay it or not? And so again, it seems like our, our passage is unfalsifiable because we don't know that evil will ultimately be used for good and then destroyed, do we? Well, yes, we do. This is why God has given us a glimpse into that forever through the book of Revelation. And we look at that because Revelation, especially the final three chapters, was consciously written to reflect Genesis 1 through 3. Because there, what do we see? We see the bud, the flower of all these seeds that God has planted. The church clothed in white robes of Christ's righteousness in Revelation 7. Revelation 19, sitting down for a wedding feast in the presence of God with Christ Jesus. He himself, Revelation 19 and 20, leads a war where he will crush evil forever, where he will cast it from existence. Revelation 21, where he will establish a new heavens and a new earth, where he will wipe away our tears, where we see the gold and the precious stones that graced Eden now become the building blocks of the future city. And where we read this, Revelation 22, the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on the other side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no lamp of sun, or light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. It is unfalsifiable no more, the Lord tells us. He will be the same forever. And so we don't know why evil exists. We don't know why this idyllic world of Genesis 1 to 2 is exploded. But we do know that the glories of Genesis 1 through 3 are really just the rays of the sun. That is Revelation 22. For the glory and the majesty and the wonder and the comfort and the love of our God are made all the more wonderful and beautiful against the backdrop of evil's dark schemes. Jonathan Edwards talks about this. He compares God's providence, his, his care through all of this, to a large, long river. And what he says is that if you look at that river, you see that it has innumerable branches beginning in different regions and at a great distance from one another. And he says that when we look at these branches, all we can see are twists and turns and impediments to it. We can't see how it gets to its final destination. If you went and stood at the nooksack, we're right next to the ocean, but you can't stand at the nooksack right here off the guide and see the ocean. You just see the river disappear. You can't see where it goes. But he moves on to say this, yet if we trace them all, all those branches of the river, they all unite at last and all come to the same issue. They disgorge themselves into one and the same great ocean. Not one of the streams fails of coming to the end at last. What he's saying there, he's saying that all we can ever see are the impediments again to the flowing of water. Again, the twists, the turns, sometimes we barely see a trickle. But if you step back, if you look at the hole, if you look at a map, you can see that no river fails to come together and find its way to the ocean. That is what the Lord is telling us in this passage. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, yes, but we can also see that he is the same forever. Because as we look ahead to the conscious reflection of those first three chapters in Genesis, or in Revelation, as we see that all the branches of Genesis pour themselves into one great ocean of God's glory and our joy, it allows us to trust that every obstacle put in our path Every difficulty we encounter is used to bring us safely home. In other words, evil is used for your good. So what does it mean that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and, and forever? It means, again, that when we look from Genesis to Revelation, we can see that he has never faltered nor will falter. He will finish what he began. He will be faithful to the end. And that faithfulness is guaranteed through all eternity. That's why we confessed earlier with the Heidelberg Catechism, we can be patient when things go against us. 
We can be thankful when things go well, and for the future, we can have a good confidence in our faithful God and Father that nothing in creation will separate us from his love. How do we know this? Because he has put in paper and ink what that forever looks like. He has shown us that who he was yesterday, he is going to be for all of eternity. And that has to have real life impacts on us today. Because as we do look back and as we do look ahead, we see that, the, that everything that the Bible says, everything we see and hear and know about God it is true for us today in this room right now. What the Bible asserts to us is that the God of magnificent delights is your God today. Jesus Christ was not one thing when he walked this earth in the Gospels. He wasn't one thing when you came to believe in him. He wasn't one thing when you had that really good and obedient day, and then he's kind of something different, and then he'll return to that next thing when you get to heaven again. No, right now in this room, he is the same. Do you know what that means? It means that in life and in death, no matter what, he will not fail you. And you can't say that about anything else in this world. Because your health is going to fail. Your spouse is going to let you down. Your children are going to drive you up the wall. Your reproductive abilities are going to falter. You're going to grow sick and tired of your job, or if you don't, you're not going to be able to keep doing it one day. And your friends are going to come and go. We live in a world of change, but what our passage says to us, what the scriptures present to us, is that God does not change. He will not fail you because he cannot fail you. He doesn't slumber. He doesn't sleep. Because he who is sovereign over creation, he who is victorious forever, is the same God for you today. You can take absolute comfort in that when you're in a dark hole that you can't escape. You can have peace when you come to the hour of death knowing that he does not abandon his own. You can find comfort when your world seems to be falling apart. Because what the word tells us is that he has every power and he has every wisdom at his disposal to bring you safely through the twisting, turning rivers of this life unto the ocean of eternity. Why? Because he is the immutable, unchanging, always the same God. Just listen how Jesus tells us this in Matthew 25. He says that the kingdom, that heavenly kingdom, that joyous next life of revelation, it was prepared for you from the beginning of the world. Not in the immediate after effects of sin, the Lord said, I wasn't expecting that. Well, I better plan this other kingdom. No, from the beginning of the world. And if that's not far back enough for us, Ephesians 1, 4 says he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. What that means is that even before Genesis 1, 1, even before God spoke light into existence, he had prepared for you and me, for his believers, another kingdom. Yeah, it was one that was going to be entered through blood and tears, but it was one that is going to outstrip the glories of Eden by an incomparable margin. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever. He is the same today. And that means that your eternal home, your eternal salvation, his love for you is unalterably sure. There is nothing in this world, nothing that you can do if you belong to Christ that can change that. I'll give one last example. Because this is something I've thought a lot about when I was driving to Calgary. And I did that because I hate driving. It's like my number one least favorite thing on earth, partly because I'm so bad at directions I could get lost coming from the parsonage. But the other thing is that because I've inherited from my dad that you just, you buy awful vehicles. You just buy old vehicles. And so I've never owned a vehicle that has not left me stranded on the side of the road. And so it's really gotten in my head. I'm unendingly convinced that my truck is going to break down. And um, honestly, I can't even get to Bellingham without thinking about it. Um, but that means that whenever I take a long trip, I'm nervous. <laughs> and so I set in my mind, where is that spot? Where is that zone, that place where I'm going to be safe? The spot where if I break down, someone can come and get me. And I don't care to see the truck again. It can burn and catch up. I don't care. I just want to go home. What's that spot where someone can come and get me? Because once I hit that spot, Sid can attest and relax, I'm calm, I enjoy the drive. And the thing I miss most about living in the city is that that spot, that zone for me, was the lights of the city. It was always such a comfort 
to be able to drive for hours and hours in the darkness only to turn a corner and see the horizon lit up. You see, we live in this world afraid of breaking down. We're so unsure so often where we go. We doubt the love of our God. We doubt that he is unchanging and immutable. But what our passage tells us is that you can look up no matter where you are and you can see the lights of the heavenly city always shining. Because what the scriptures tell us from Genesis 1-3 to John 1 verse 1 to Revelation 22 is that the very light of that city is your unchanging Savior. And if you are in him, you live in that safe zone no matter where you traverse in this life. And so what we have studied in Genesis is a God who is powerful and wise beyond compare. And yet who has planned for and prepared for the salvation and deliverance of his people before time began. Who accomplished it in Christ Jesus. And again, who put your eternal future in paper and ink so that you can take it to the bank. This means your God does not learn. He doesn't change his mind He doesn't react to new situations or new information. God doesn't have a plan B because the glories of Revelation 22 and your salvation, they were fixed from the beginning of the world. Wherever you are, see the light of eternity. It doesn't flicker. It doesn't fade. It pierces always through the night sky if only we look up. And so if you want a practical application to this passage, tell me what to do. Here it is. Do not let yourself forget that. Do not let yourself forget that in a world of shadow and change, one thing is always constant. One thing always remains. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever because he cannot be anything else. As he promised in John 16, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. I think it's John 14, sorry. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Lord, what hope you give us that you are unchanging that your grace is greater than our sins, that your grace is greater than our unfaithfulness, that your grace will see us through to the end, and that as we looked at last week, you being the holy God, that that gives us the assurance that you cannot have a plan B or something different because you are always working for your own glory, and it is to your glory that you have told us and reminded us and put into scripture that Jesus Christ, the spoken word of creation, the very light that shines from the beginning of time, the one who has spoken through the Old Testament and the prophets, the one to whom they testify to, the one who came and lived perfectly, who kept that covenant of works, the one who gave his life on the cross, the one who laid three days in the tomb, the one who was raised to new life, the one who has ascended to heaven, the one who continually lives to intercede for us, the one whose work is finished, the one who is coming back, the one who will welcome us to him is the same God for us today. Let us take comfort in that, we pray in your name, amen. Please stand. And we'll respond by singing, O oh God, our help in ages past.
just a moment, we will close by singing, Now blessed be the Lord our God, but be strengthened and receive the benediction of our Lord. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it.